In this video, we're going to make a persistent particle system. This is a great system for when you want to spawn some particles and have them stay on the map like some blood or footprints. Let's begin! Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey, and this channel is all about helping you learn how to make your own games with in-depth tutorials made by a professional indie game developer. So if you find the video helpful, consider subscribing. Okay, so here's what we want to create. Over here I have my character, I can move him around, and when I do you can already see two uses of the persistent particle system. When I move you can see dirt being kicked around and vanishing, and you can also see some footprints where I went through. So as you can see the dirt vanishes, but the footprints stay always on the map. Now another use is with the weapon, so whenever I shoot, there you go, there are some very nice shell particles exiting my weapon, and once they stop they stay on the particle system. And finally, over here I have an enemy, and when I shoot him, there you go, you can see some blood particles, and if I shoot him some more, he turns into a flying body and leaves behind a nice trail of blood particles. And as you can see, once the particles stop moving, they remain permanently on the map. So these are various uses for the persistent particle system. We have particles being spawned, they move, then they stop in their final destination, and they stay there forever. Alright, so this is our goal, let's get to it! Alright, so here's our starting scene. Over here I have the player and I can move him around and shoot. And as you can see there are no particles anywhere. And over here is an enemy. And again, I can shoot him but no particles come out. And after a while, I kill him and there goes the flying body and again, no particles. Okay, so this is our starting point. Now the way we're going to build our system is by making a custom dynamic mesh. So if you're not familiar with how to make a custom mesh through code, then check out the video linked in the description. That video will teach you everything you need to know about how a mesh is made and what are the elements required to make it. So here for our system, let's start off with the basics and draw a simple quad. So first, let's make our script, a new script. Let's call this the mesh particle system. And here we make a new game object and drag the script onto it. Okay, now to make our mesh visible, we need to add a mesh filter. That's the component that holds a mesh and a mesh renderer which is a component that defines how the mesh is displayed. Okay, so far so good. Let's open up the script. Okay, now in here, let's set up our mesh. Okay, so here's our starting mesh code. Again, if you're not familiar with this, then go first check out the mesh video linked in the description. Once you see that video, you won't be able to understand what all of this is. So essentially we have the vertices, the UVs, the triangles, and all of it makes up our mesh. So we create the mesh and we apply it to our mesh filter. And if we run this code, here with the code running, we can see that indeed we have a mesh inside of our mesh filter. There you go, zero vertices, zero triangles, but it's in here. Okay, great. So now in here, let's make a simple quad. Okay, so I've added a nice function in order to add a quad. Again, in following with what we've learned in the previous video about how a mesh works, for a quad we need four vertices, four UVs, and six triangles. So here on this function we are modifying these arrays. So here we're just setting up the vertices and the triangles. So here we define a certain rotation that we want to add into our sprite. In this case, let's start off simple, so at zero. And here we just apply the rotation onto our quad size in order to come up with the, all of the corners. So by applying the various rotations, we can take our quad size and build our quad. So in here, we are placing the vertex on the lower left corner. Then we place on the upper left corner, then on the upper right corner, and finally on the lower right corner. And then we have the triangles, which simply connect them. So we connect the zero, so lower left, into the one, so upper left, and into the two, which is on the upper right. Again, if all of this seems mysterious, make sure you check out the previous mesh video and all of this will be clear. So let's see this. And there it is, we have our nice pink square. It's pink because we did not add a material nor the UV, but if we pause, over here with our wireframe enabled, you can see our quad is correct. So we have our four vertices with our two polygon triangles. Okay, so far so good. Now in here, let's make sure that we take care of our base index automatically so that we can spawn this in order to add a new quad every single time.
Okay, so here I've added an int for the current quad index, as well as a constant for the max quad amount. Each mesh is limited to a total of 65,000 vertices. So since we are making quads, essentially we have a total of 65,000 divided by four. So we have around a total of 15,000 maximum quads we can put in a single mesh. So with that maximum, then we simply update in here. If we go past that, the mesh is full. So let's not do anything. We're going to handle this later. And then here we simply calculate the vertex index based on the quad index multiplied by four, since we have four vertices per quad. And on the triangle, we multiply by six. And then at the end of all of this, we simply increment the quad index. This function also takes in a position, which is simply applied into our vertices. And finally here, when we initialize our vertices, we multiply them by the max quad amount. So just like that, they all have the correct size. Okay. Okay. So in here we are spawning two quads. So we should be able to see two quads. Let's see. And here we are. And indeed you can see two different quads. And here we can see the two quads being rendered and they are all part of the same mesh. Okay, great. So now that we can spawn multiple quads, let's deal with the UV. Okay, so here I've added the UV. As you can see, they use the same indexes as the vertices. And in here, I just set it to display the entire texture. So on the lower left corner, we are on 0, 0, and on the upper right, we are on 1, 1. Now here, back in the editor, all we need to do is create a new material. And in here, we just drag the sprite just like that. And we drag the material into our mesh render. Okay, so let's see. And yep, there it is, we have our UV being applied so we can see our quads using our texture. Awesome. So now let's add a quad every time we fire our weapon. So for that, I have a script which fires an event, so we can use that. So I add the serialized field for the character aim handler script. So here, just drag the script reference onto it. Now in here, we can simply go into it and subscribe to the onshoot event. So here, how this character aim handler is implemented is not relevant to our mesh particle system. All we need is to have enough information in order to be able to spawn our particles. So just for testing, I'm going to add a text pop-up. So I'm using this function from the utilities, which as always you can grab for free from unitycodemonkey.com. So with this, we should be able to see when this event is being fired. So let's see. And here we are. And when I shoot, yep, there you go. We have the nice event being fired. Okay, great. Again, always remember to keep your code nice and clean and all your systems decoupled. So the mesh particle system doesn't care how this character works. All it cares is that it has an event so that it can do its thing. So this event passes in a gun endpoint position. So let's spawn a quad on it. So we simply call add quad and we pass in the gun endpoint position. Let's get rid of these two and just like that. And here, since we're adding a quad after being instantiated, every time we modify our local arrays, we need to update them on the mesh. So let's copy this and add it down here. Okay, so we should be able to see a quad spawned whenever we fire our weapon. So here I am looking around and I shoot. And there you go, there's a nice quad being spawned exactly where it's supposed to. So click and click and there you go. So I can now spawn as many quads as I want whenever I shoot. All right, great. So now that we have this working, let's make our quad move. So back in our particle system script, let's go down here to make a function so we can update each quad. So let's make it a public void and we're going to call this update quad. And now in here, we receive an int for the quad index Then receive a vector three for the new position. And then we can also receive all the others. So we float for the rotation. And if we want a vector three for the quad size. So in order to update it, we do exactly the same code we were doing in here. So let's copy from here. Let's put it in here. And now up here on this one, we call this. Pass in the quad index, then the position, then a rotation and the quad size. And then we update our mesh arrays just like that. Okay. So we now have a function to add a new quad. So essentially it modifies the current quad index and then increments it. And then we have a function to modify whatever quad index we give it. So now here, just for testing, let's make it constantly move. So here, when we call add quad, let's make sure that it returns the current spawned quad index. So this one returns an int and we're going to store an int for the spawned quad index. And then we return this. So that means that here, when we spawn a new quad, when the character shoots, we can have an int for our spawn quad index. 
and then we can use this quad index in order to call our update quad to constantly move our quad. So here, just for testing, I'm going to use the very useful function updater, again, from the utilities. So this one takes in an action that gets called on every update. So on every update, let's call update quad. We pass in our spawn quad index, and then let's simply increase the position. Alright, so with this very simple code, we should be able to add a quad whenever we shoot, and then that same quad will constantly be moving up and to the right on every single frame. So let's try. Okay, here we are, now if I shoot, and there you go, there's the quad, it gets spawned and it's moving up and away. And shoot some more, and every single one of them is independently being moved away. Alright, awesome. Now let's play around with the rotation and scaling to make sure that it all works. Alright, so here I just added two fields, one for the quad size and for the rotation, and again we're doing the same thing, increasing on every frame. So let's see if this is working. Okay, here we are, and let's shoot, and yep, there you go, the quad was instantiated, and it is constantly increasing in size and rotating on every single frame. Awesome! And again, we can spawn a bunch more, and yep, each one of them is independently being rotated and increasing in size. Okay. Now these shells are actually not supposed to be squares, but rather some rectangles, so let's do that now. So here we should also modify the add quad in order to receive a starting float for the rotation and a vector 3 for the quad size. And we simply pass it in here. Okay. So now in order to make it a square, Let's simply put 0.5 on the X and 1 on the Y, and let's see what this looks like. And here we are and click, and there you go, as you can see, it is not correct. Instead of a rectangle, we got a square that is slightly rotated. So here when we set the vertex positions, we need to do some different math in case the quad size is skewed or not. Okay, so if it is skewed, we have to apply the rotation only to our actual rotation, and then we multiply it by our quad size, impacting for each vertex. So minus minus, minus plus, and so on. So all I need to do is call true on the skewed. Alright, let's test. Here we are, and shoot. And yep, there you go, we have our sprite displayed as a rectangle. Now let's apply rotation and scaling. And here we are, and shoot, and yep, there you go, it is rotating and scaling. Okay, awesome. Now, instead of always displaying every single quad as an entire texture, let's make sure we add some proper UV for each specific texture. So over here in our script, let's go up here to define a struct that we're going to set in the editor. So we have a struct for our particle UV pixels, and we have two vector 2 ints, one for the 0, 0, so lower left corner, and one for the 1, 1, so the upper right corner. So essentially we're going to input pixel coordinates for the lower left and upper right, and then it will be automatically calculated into normalized values. So in here let's make a serialized field of an array of particle UV pixels. And to make it show up in the editor, all we need to do is mark this struct as system.serializable. Okay, now in the editor. In here you can see that we have a field for the particle UV pixels array. And for surge, let's just put 1. So here we have one element. There you go for the UV00 and 1, 1. And for now, let's try displaying the entire texture. So here is the bullet shell casing. As you can see, it's a simple 10 by 20 texture. So here, for the 0, 0, start on 0, 0. And for the 1, let's put it on 10 by 20. Okay, that's our field set up. So now here, our script has all of the UV data inside this array. But the mesh works with normalized values. So we need to convert them from pixels into those normalized values. So here I'm making a nice internal struct. This one contains vector 2 ints for the UV0 and UV1, and these will be the normalized values. So now I have an array of UV coordinates, so let's fill this up.
Okay, so here we have our conversion. We go into the mesh renderer in order to grab the material. Then from that material, we grab the texture. And with the texture, we grab the width and height. And then with that, we create the new UV chords. So we take the values in pixels and divide by the width and the height in order to get the normalized values. So at the end, we can set the UV chords array to be this list dot two array. All right. So essentially with this design here, where we have two different structs, we have one that is a very nice user-friendly structure that we expose in the editor. So we can input pixels, which are easy. And then we have our internal structure, which converts those pixels into normalized values that we can then use to run our code. Right, so with all of this, now we just need to apply this to our quads. So when we add a quad, let's also receive an int for the UV index. Okay, and now we go down here, and now instead of showing the entire texture for everyone, let's apply that one. So we go into the UV chords array and access the UV index. So this returns a UV chords. All right, so here we're applying everything. So on the lower left corner, we have the UV00. For the upper right, we have the 11. And for these, we calculate the new UVs. Okay, so with this, we should now be able to define which part of the texture we show in our quad. Okay, so we should be able to see the full quad just like previously. Let's click. And yep, there it is. Everything still works great. All right. Now let's see the proper use case for all of this. Here, instead of having this material, let's make a material of the blood, which as you can see is a spreadsheet with various stages. So here, let's drag the blood material. And here you can see the texture is 128 by 16. So if we put that value, 128 by 16, and we click, and again, we still see the exact same entire texture, but that's not what we want. So let's stop. And instead, let's make it just 16 by 16. And now we shoot. And there you go, now we can only see the very first particle. So here, just fill it up with all of them. All right, so I've input all of the pixel coordinates for all of the various elements. And now here for testing, let's choose a random UV index. Okay, so here around, let's shoot. And there you go, there's one blood particle, and there's another one, and as you can see, it's different, and that one is different, and different, and different, and different. So just like this, we can input our UV coordinates, and they get calculated automatically and used based on a certain index. All right, awesome. Okay, so with this working, now let's make some scripts to handle the blood and the shell particles. So here, let's make a new script. Call this the shell particle system handler. And now here, this one already has all the coordinates for the blood. So let's leave this one and set duplicate this. Let's call this new one the shell particle system handler and drag this script onto it and drag the correct material. All right, so here we have this one with the correct coordinates, the correct material and this script. And for now, this other one is disabled. We'll deal with the blood later. So now in this script, we're going to handle logic for every single shell. So let's start off with a function to spawn a simple shell. Let's also make this a singleton class so we can easily call this function. All right, so now we want to use this function. So let's take our testing code away from the particle system and into a proper testing class. So here we just make a new C sharp script called our testing. Let's make a testing game object. Drag the script onto it, okay. And now here let's do our testing. So let's copy all of this. Okay, so now our mesh particle system no longer contains any references to the player or anything other than the particle system. And here on the testing, we have a reference to the player and we are subscribing to the on shoot event. So in here, let's test our shell. So we go into the shell particle system handler. We access the instance and we call spawn shell. So here we pass in the position and a direction. Okay, so this simple. Now let's deal with this. Here on the shell system handler, let's create a class that will handle a single shell. Now on the constructor, let's receive the position and direction. Let's also receive the mesh particle system. Okay, so when we create a single, we go into the mesh, we call our add quad function. 
So this will return our private int for this quad index. All right, so we instantiate our quad with our position, rotation, and quad size. And then we're going to have a update function. And in here, we're going to handle our movement. So we update the position, update the rotation, and update our quad. All right, so this is our single class, which represents a single shell. So now we can go back up here into our main class. And we're going to have a list of single. And now on this one, we have a private void update. And on our update, we're simply going to cycle through all of our shells. And we simply call the update function. Okay, that's it. Now in here, all we do is go into the single list and we add a new single and pass in the position, direction, and the mesh particle system. So just like that, we have this very nice class, which takes care of everything related to the shell particles. And all we need to do is call this function, which we are doing over here in our testing script. So we are spawning shells whenever we shoot with our character and they won't be moving up and to the right. So let's test. Okay, so here we are, let's shoot. And there you go, there's the particle. It was correctly spawned and it's correctly moving away. All right, awesome. So now we have everything still working like previously, except everything is encapsulated into its own nice class. Now, instead of just making them go up and to the right, let's make it based on the rotation of the player. Okay, so here I calculated the shoot direction based on the two values that this event fires. So it triggers the shoot position, which is where we click, and the gun endpoint position. So using those two, we can get the shoot direction. Then here, just offsetting it backwards so it doesn't spawn the shell exactly on the gun endpoint position, but rather more towards where the weapon should be fired. And then we have the shell move direction, which we just take the shoot direction and we apply a negative 90 degree angle. So let's see this. So here I am, and if I shoot, Yep, there you go, the particle left right from there and went upwards. So like this, it's going up and then it's going to the left and it's going down just like that. All right, great. So now that we have our shells correctly moving away, let's make them stop after a while. So here just add some slow down speed code. Okay, so here I just added a move speed field. Then we increase the position by the move speed, the same thing with the rotation, and then we simply slow down the move speed on every frame. So the particle should move quickly and then slow down. Okay, so we are in shoot, and yep, there you go, the particle goes away and then stops. So shoot a bunch, and there you go, just like that. All right, now just add some randomization. Okay, so here we are, and I shoot, and shoot at the same place, and there you go. I add some randomization on the angles as well as the move speed. All right, awesome. So in here, we are spawning shells, and we are moving them. And now, when they're done moving, let's update and remove them from our single list. So here, let's add a public ball. Is movement complete? And we simply return if the move speed is under a certain amount. So then we go all the way up here, we call update, all right, and then we ask if the single, if the movement is complete, then we want to remove it from the list. So let's convert this from a 4H into a 4. All right, so we update, we call is movement complete, and then if it is complete, then we want to remove it from the list. So you remove it and then go backwards on the index, all right. So in here, just for testing, let's add a debug log on the single list count. So you should be able to see this increase whilst the shell is active and decrease as they stop. Okay, so here we are and on the logs you can see that we have no shells active. So now we click, and there you go, we have one and after a while it stops and there you go, zero. So keep shooting, a bunch of them are active and now after a while, yep, there you go, zero active. So just like that, our code is now spawning and cleaning up after itself, awesome. So just like this, you can already see our very nice particle mesh system. So they are all going and they spawn and they stay there. So I can move over them and they remain in there. So we have the code working for persistent particles, but we can also use this for particles that disappear. So over here I have a nice dirt sprite sheet. So these particles are meant to disappear. 
So here, let's duplicate the shell particle system, and this will be our dirt particle system. Okay, so here I have the dirt particle system handler on a new game object using this script with a dirt material. So now here on the system handler, let's go into the single and let's add the behavior for the dirt instead of the shell. The main thing we're going to remove is the rotation since we don't want the dirt to rotate and just like that, okay. Now on testing, so here we can ask the character if it is moving and if it is moving, then let's go into the dirt particle system handler, access the instance and let's rename that function in order to be not spawn shell. So in here, just rename this into spawn dirt. So we spawn it based on the character position and with direction of the character that I get move direction multiplied by minus one. So the dirt won't be kicking backwards. Okay, so just like this, we should be able to see our dirt sprites being spawned. Let's see. Okay, here we are and move. And there you go, the dirt particles are indeed being spawned. Now they are way too many since it's going one per each frame. So let's reduce that. Okay, so here I've made a nice delay function. We simply store the next spawn time on a float. And whenever we spawn, we increase that. So let's see. Okay, so no particles since we're idle, now move, and there you go, the particles get spawned and they no longer go exactly one per frame. All right, awesome. However, again, these dirt particles are not meant to be persistent, so let's deal with that. In here, we have our code for a single dirt particle. Okay, we check if movement complete, okay. And then let's also add a public void, let's call it destroy cell. And the way we're going to destroy a particle is actually very simple. We simply go into the mesh particle system, and we're going to make a function called destroy quad and we pass in the quad index. Okay, so let's make that function. So here we are in the mesh particle system and let's go make a public void destroy quad. We receive an int for the quad index. In order to destroy it, it's actually very simple. We simply calculate the vertexes. So we simply, based on the quad, we modify all those vertexes in order to go into vector 3.0. So essentially we reduce the entire size of the quad so nothing is visible. Okay, so we have the destroy quad now back into the dirt particle system. And here we simply need to call this. So let's go on the way up here. When movement is complete, we call the single, tell it to destroy itself and remove it from the list. All right, so let's see if they vanish. Okay, here we are and let's move. And there you go, there's the particles. And after a while, yep, there you go, they all start to vanish. So after a while, when they stop moving, they completely vanish. All right, awesome. So we now have disappearing particles. Now here, if we look at the dirt texture, you can see that it's actually a sprite sheet. It has various frames of animation. So let's make sure we add that. So first I need to add all of the pixels in here on the mesh particle system. All right, so I have added all of the pixels for each single sprite sheet position on the entire texture. And now here, the way that we set up our mesh particle system makes it very easy in order to do frame animation. And here we already received the UV index, so all we need to do is actually increase it. So here on the dirt, let's go into our single in order to modify the behavior in here. So first we store a private int for the UV index. And here we start off at zero. All right, so here I just added some simple flipbook animation. So we have a timer and a timer max. So in here we're going to run every 10 frames per second. So whenever the timer goes past the max, we simply reduce the timer. So in here, that one. We reduce the timer and we increase the UV index and that's what we pass on the update quad. So that's it, very simple and let's test. Okay, here we are and move. And yep, there you go. As you can see, we have our nice dirt particles being spawned and they are being nicely animated on a frame by frame basis. All right, that's the effect, awesome. So here we are with a smaller quad and fewer particles, and there you go, there's the nice effect. All right, awesome. Now, one thing we still need to fix is in terms of performance, looking at the stats, you can see how it goes up massively every time we increase. So just like that, the more particles we have, the much higher it is. And we also need to fix over here the bounce. There you go, once we go up here, they are vanished. That's because of the bounce. So let's fix both those things. 
first for the bounds we can simply go into the mesh and set the bounds and here we can simply put a very massive size and just like this if we go all the way up here there you go now the mesh no longer vanishes and works all the time and everywhere so you can go down here shoot and all the particles are still up there and down there all right great if you want you can calculate this into a proper bounds but for most cases just making it huge will make it work so now for the performance the biggest issue is whenever we update a quad we are uploading it to the mesh so if we have several quads being updated on the same frame we end up calling this and passing our local arrays into our mesh multiple times per frame. That is obviously very wasteful, so let's make sure we only do this at most once per frame. So for that, we can go up here and let's make a private ball and call this update vertices, update UV and update triangles. Okay, now let's go down here and make a private void update. And on update, if we have update vertices then we simply update the mesh dot vertices equals our vertices all right just like that do everything for all the others all right there it is now let's also make sure this runs at the end so instead of update let's put it on late update and now in here whenever we modify something so on destroy quad let's set the update vertices into true then here when we update everything instead of calling this let's update the vertices update the uvs and we also update the triangles so just like this we simply set the booleans if we wanted we could then break this into three separate functions to update the vertices the uvs or the triangles but for now let's leave it like this so we just set it to true and then at the end of the frame if it is true then we update them if not then we'll leave it alone all right so just like this we should greatly have improved our performance and here, if we look at the stats, previously we were going all the way up to 8 milliseconds, and now if we move, there you go, only 2. And we can move and shoot and a whole bunch of particles, and there you go, it's now much better. Alright, so now I'm just going to add all of the other particles the same way that we add these two. Alright, so I have implemented all of the particles. So first of all, we still got the shells, very nice. Then we still got the dirt, and you can already see the footprints. So after some time, the footprints get spawned. There you go, they stay there. And then we have the blood, so whenever I shoot him, yep, there you go, some blood particles going out. And when I kill him, and it spawns the flying body, and there you go, he flies away, and the flying body spawns some more particles. So just like this, we have a whole bunch of types, all of them being spawned. And after all the movement ends, everything stays nice and stable, and they stay on the map forever. So just like this, we have a very cool persistent particle system. Awesome! However, in here we still have two slight issues. First is simply the amount of quads. In here we defined a max quad amount of 15,000. So as soon as we go past that, in here we are no longer going to spawn any more quads. We could solve this by dynamically creating a new mesh every time one of them is full. And the second problem has to do with sorting. So over here you can see some blood. Now let's spawn some shell particles. So over here is the enemy. Now behind them I'm going to place a whole bunch of shell particles. As well as some footprints and stuff. Okay. So now when I shoot them. And there you go. Blood particles being spawned. And just like that you can see that the blood particles which were spawned afterwards. Actually show up behind both the shells and the footprints. The issue here is because we have various separate meshes, so one of them has to be on top of the other. 
So in order to make sure that new particles stay on top of older particles, we would need to use a giant texture atlas that contains both the bullets, the footprints, the blood, and anything that we want. Place them all inside a giant texture atlas and use a single mesh with that giant texture atlas to spawn every single one of our particles. So if we merged all of this in the same mesh, it would solve our sorting issues. So those are the two issues that we still have with this class. This video is already super long, so let me know in the comments if you'd like to see a video covering the solutions to both of those problems and expand upon this further. Now in the future, something that I really want to do is take this whole system and convert all of it into super fast ECS. So stay tuned for that. As always, you can download the project files and utilities from unitycodemonkey.com. Subscribe to the channel for more Unity tutorials, post any questions you have in the comments, and I'll see you next time.